Greetings. I would like to welcome everybody who has joined us today for our Teaching the Faith to Adults uh, webinar with Reverend Heath Trampy. And we are going to get started in just about one minute. We're going to start at one minute after one because hopefully we've got some more folks signing on and we will uh, we'll get rolling, like I said, in about one minute. Hi, everyone. And see it worked. I waited and we had a couple more people sign on. So it is uh, again great awesome. to have everybody with us today for our webinar. Uh, God's blessings to all of you. We are pleased to welcome back to our webinar screens uh, Reverend Dr. Heath Trampy out of beautiful York, Nebraska. So we, uh, is the weather beautiful in York today? The weather is windy, but it's sunny and beautiful. It's always windy in York, Nebraska, and most other places in Nebraska. So uh, it's yeah, it's just part of the deal. So it, it's so good. We'll be talking about teaching the faith to adults, connecting, growing, and sharing for adult faith formation today. Uh, just a little housekeeping. If you have any questions for Pastor Trampy as we move along today, there is an, a, a chat feature over on the left side of your uh, screen. If you don't see it, there's a little arrow up there. If you click on the aerial, that'll, arrow, that'll open that chat feature, and you'll be able to type your question in there. If um, it, or up at the top of the screen, there is an attendee or audience chat feature up there, and you can type your questions in there as well. At the end of our webinar, you'll get a link for a survey to tell us how we did today and let us know how, to, how we can keep improving our webinars, uh, which we give every month uh, at 1 o'clock on a Thursday. And uh, you will also have access to Pastor Trampy's uh, PowerPoint for today. So take advantage of that and, and you can use that in any way you see fit in your congregations. And without further ado, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this day and for the opportunity you give us so often to share your love through your word to those around us. And especially we pray for your blessing upon our webinar today, that it might enlighten, enrich, enrich and enlighten us to better serve the adults in our congregation and those with whom we come into contact, that we might better share with them Christ's love in the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Trampy, take it away. All right. Thank you, uh, Pastor Kolbaum. Uh, hi, everyone. It's good to be back with you. I did present on this topic last April, and I presented it at the RSDM conference last November, but it has had some updates, and some of you probably have not heard it before, so I'm excited to have you with me today. Um, I am going to be talking about connecting, growing, and sharing as part of this process of teaching our adults. It's more than just Bible class. Um, I'm so glad that the PowerPoint's going to be available to you. It's a heavy-duty uh, PowerPoint. That's the way I roll, so I'm going to have to move pretty quick to get through everything. You're going to notice some uh, materials being talked about in the PowerPoint. If you would like any of those materials, please just ask, and I'll make sure that you get them. I think it's good for us to share ideas with one another. So who am I? Just uh, by way of introduction, my name is Heath Trampy. I serve in York, Nebraska, which is kind of like Seward. A lot of people know Seward, Nebraska because of Concordia. We are 25 minutes down the road, exact same size, uh, pretty much the same makeup of community. So I kind of feel like I'm back where I went to school. And I'm only an hour and a half down the road from where I grew up. I'm married to Andrea. She likes to go by Ani. Uh, we've been married for about 13 years. We've been together for about 20, which is a lot for a couple of 36-year-olds. Uh, we have Jonathan, who is eight, and Andrew, who is five, and they both attend the parochial school here in York. And we have been in Fort Wayne. I'll talk about that in a minute, as well as missionaries in Europe. I won't talk about that. If you ever have uh, questions about that, just ask. Happy to answer. My perspective is kind of a tale of two congregations. And so just briefly, like very briefly, 
I want to cover the two ministries that I've experienced. That's going to help you understand where I'm coming from. So the first church I served is St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I was an associate pastor. St. Peter's was 160 years old. I believe at that point it was the third largest LCMS church in Fort Wayne, which is no small thing. Uh, 2,000 plus members, about 800 on a Sunday. Um, and even though we were located in a city of a quarter million, we were only about three minutes from the outskirts of town, which meant if you drove for five, six minutes, you were at farms. And so we had quite a few people who were farmers and agriculturally connected in that congregation. That was good practice for coming back home to Nebraska. Now I serve at Faith Lutheran Church, as Todd mentioned, and Faith is a very different congregation from St. Peter's. We are only 50 years old. And we have less than 500 people in our baptized membership. It's kind of a neat church, though. We get over 200 people a week in worship. So uh, we've got a wonderful percentage in that regard. But we only have about 380 baptized members. So we are a small congregation. We're located in York, uh, which has a population of about 8,000. Um, and we are not heavy on farmers here. And that may be your experience as well. But we do have a lot of people who are connected to and dependent upon the agricultural field and the way things are going in ag. So the first question that I want us to sort of wrestle with, and perhaps this is the main question, is how can we effectively teach the faith to adults? How can we foster a community where we gather around Christ and we do more than just worship, although that's very important. I'll get to that. But we're also deliberately engaging ourselves in the study of God's word. That's something we're going to be uh, trying to tackle. And I've got sort of a three-part of attack. We're going to talk about connecting, and particularly in worship. We're going to talk about growing, and not numerical growth. That's wonderful when it happens. We're going to be talking about the kind of growth that comes as a result of you know, gaining maturity, gaining perspective, and also understanding the world in which we live uh, through the lens of God's Word, and then sharing. Sharing what we know and sharing our faith with our families, our friends, our co-workers, whoever else we encounter in uh, everyday life. So I'm going to start with connecting. And this presentation is not going to be just about worship. But it's also not just about Bible study. I think worship has a component that we need to attend to in this discussion. So the way we connect is we come together and we worship our Lord. We receive his forgiveness in word and sacrament. We sing songs, we give our tithes and offerings, and we fellowship with one another. And if your church is like many, if not most churches, this is your largest gathering during the week. You might get 100, 200, 300 people for worship and many less in Bible study. And so I'm looking at worship not only as this key aspect of our lives in Christ, but also as an opportunity for us to get people engaged in Bible study. I've got a little snippet of the uh, hymnal there. We all know it very well. Do the red, speak the black, right? And there's little references there to the scriptures, and there's more beyond that. Our whole liturgy, our whole divine service has a recognizable pattern, and it lends itself to teaching and instructing already without us adding anything to it. But how can we make it even more intentional so that there is movement from worship to Bible study. Let's talk about that. We have a thing called the faith notes. It still gets called the insert. It still gets called the bulletin because people's mindsets change very slowly, but I think it has been embraced. We actually got rid of our monthly newsletter, and we started giving people basically the monthly newsletter items every week. In, in It's a big insert, but it's an insert. I'll show you what it looks like right here, and if you are interested in this, let me know. I can send you the file. So they get one 11 by 17 piece of paper folded in half. It's, it's kind of like what you would see with a newsletter. And on the, the one side of the front page, you get everyone who's helping. It's usually first and last names. I just wanted this to be a little more anonymous since we're sharing this online. There's a big welcome at the top of the front page and then items of immediate interest below that. On the second page, we have some social media information. We have some financial information and other news items that may be recurring or you know they've been in there for a while and they're just not as, as pressing. We've also added an item that I'll talk about in a little bit uh, that's not pictured in this one. We have a Bible study over the hymn of the day, some information about the Lutheran Hour. We certainly support the Lutheran Hour here at Faith. And then we have our week at a glance. We still give a monthly calendar, but we do have a week at a glance. And then we have prayers. And again, first and last names would be included in the actual Faith Notes. This is just for the sake of the presentation. 
So how do we encourage movement for those who are already coming to worship, which I think we can agree is usually our largest gathering during the week? How can we get them moving? So we have an opening scroller. We utilize PowerPoint in our congregation. Uh, we find that PowerPoint makes it much easier for newcomers who may not be as familiar with the hymnal. It also really helps young families. We have a lot of young families, and when you're holding a child in your arms, uh, it can be difficult to hold a hymnal in your hands. Now, we have hymnals, and we definitely encourage their use, but we also have the PowerPoints for those who would like to use them, and it's just the service up there, no, no shenanigans. We do have an opening scroller, and I make sure that the Bible study is one of the main things that is featured on that opening scroller. I mentioned the Bible study in the sermon probably at least two to three times a month, just touching on it, just making sure people understand how it's connected to what I'm preaching. Uh, we have verbal announcements at the end of the service, and I add uh, Bible study to that each and every week. Here's what we're going to be doing today, and I think you're going to be interested in it for this reason. And then it's also in those written faith notes that I mentioned. And another question for you to wrestle with. How can I get the greeters involved? How can I get the elders involved? How can I get the ushers involved? How can I get the evangelism team involved? We are constantly rethinking the way we do things. And when it works, it works. When it doesn't, we toss it out or we save it for another day. So that's connecting. And that's really just meant to be a bit of an appetizer as we enter into the main body of this presentation. Uh, for the most part, I want to talk about the growth that we have as we spend time in God's word. So we grow in our understanding of the word. And as we grow in our understanding of the word, we grow in our understanding of the way we ought to be living as Christians in the world. And I am going to mention vocation later in this presentation. So it's coming, just in case you're anticipating it. So every congregation is a little different. St. Peter's was very different from faith. And both of them are very different from Trinity Amherst, which is the church I grew up in. And so knowing the DNA of your congregation, I think, is helpful, especially uh, a little bit later. I'm going to talk about articulating our DNA a little bit, helping people to understand what it is that makes us tick, what it is that makes us quirky. I think people are more attracted to the congregation they're in when they understand it better. That's just my impression and my experience, of course. We offer many different types of Bible studies at Faith, and I'm sure it's not exclusive to us. Your churches, I'm sure, offer these things as well. We have individual studies, and I'll go into each of these in more depth in a moment. We have small group studies, which I definitely believe in. I think it's a great way for people to get connected on a deeper level. And then we have corporate Bible study. That'd be like your Sunday morning Bible study. It's not just that, but I will talk all about what we do on Sunday morning and why it has worked for us. I did not inherit a strong reality when I got to faith. And so I've had to sort of carve some of these niches out. I'll kind of explain what I did and, and hopefully it'll be helpful for some of you as well. So we want to grow in our study. So we have individual Bible studies that are not only available, but they are encouraged. I verbally encourage people to take part in these studies. One, uh, a couple times a year, I offer to people a New Testament, Old Testament chronological Bible reading plan. That's a mouthful. Basically, uh, they go through the New Testament in a chronological order, not the whole New Testament, key sections. Then they go through the Old Testament in a chronological order after the New Testament, not the whole Bible, just key sections. And this gives people who know the whole Bible a chance to refresh themselves on some of the core material. This also gives people who are maybe a little intimidated by the Genesis to Revelation reading plan. This gives them an opportunity to engage God's word in a meaningful way. And so I'll actually print that out, and I'll put it in the faith notes a couple times a year. Nobody has ever said, hey, we're sick of seeing this thing. And I would say, hey, if you've got one and you kept it, give it to a friend. It might be a nice way for them to get into the Bible. We also have small catechism reading plans. Now, this was a big thing for us uh, last year with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. You can see in the picture there those, uh, those enamel coins. What we did is we challenged people. If they read the 31 pages or 30 pages of the small catechism proper, we would give them a little coin, not, not one of these big guys, but a little coin um, that had the Trinity on it as, as sort of an incentive for doing that. People love incentives, even if they say they don't, they love them. And then if they read the whole catechism and explanation, which we all know is a long document, 350, 400 pages, a long document, then they would get one of those bigger coins. And it was a little bit of an investment on the church's part, but people sure did get excited about it. And we sold a lot of catechisms to people who didn't have a catechism. 
And maybe their catechism was from the 40s, and now they had one of the new catechisms. So it worked out really well. We also have a new church talk explain section in our faith notes. You know, we use words like pew, pulpit, chasuble, cincture. We use words like that like everyone knows what they mean, but a lot of people may not. Even if you've heard of a cincture, do you know what it is? It's that rope that pastors wear around their waists, and sometimes accolades do as well. And so we have a little section in our faith notes that explains those things for people. Now, I don't wear a chasuble, but it's still good for people to know what it is. And so I, you can access most of that information through the LCMS website. I would encourage you to look it up. Um, they've got this great glossary that we just take an item out of each week and put it in there, and people have said it helps. Um, we put the whatabouts from um, A.L. Berry. Uh, those are fantastic. Boy, those are awesome. A, we need to expand on those, but I'm glad we have what we have. We'll throw those in as an insert. Uh, if somebody has a really important item that we need to throw in there, we'll put that as an insert. This list could be expanded and could be so much more creative. Uh, the sky's the limit. We also grow with others. We have a lot of small group studies that are available. We have your traditional ones, like the dedicated ones you see at the bottom there. Ours have names because that's cute and fun. Uh, but you might just have small group one, small group two, or you know Larry's small group and Jan's small group. You just don't know. It's different for every church. But we also have a young adult gathering. Now, I will admit, full disclosure, full transparency, our young adult gathering went over like gangbusters at St. Peter's in Fort Wayne. It has had a hard time getting off the ground here at Faith. Our young adults are very busy. They're mostly professionals, doctors, lawyers, you know, whatever, medical people, people who are constantly attached to some aspect of their job, and most of them have kids. And so it's just been challenging for us to get together, but we do try to get together a couple times a year. We have a women's Bible study, we have a men's Bible study. We have a Bible study at a popular restaurant here in town, world famous chances are with the other LCMS church in town. And we get 40 to 50 people together just to go through books of the Bible. Right now we're going through Revelation and we've had a good time, believe it or not, going through Revelation together. We also grow as a congregation. So I'm going to talk in a bit about what I inherited when I arrived at faith. It wasn't ideal, but my goodness, there was no time to cry. We just got to work. Um, but right now we have a Sunday morning Bible study that I personally lead. Um, I generally am the only leader of that group. We cover a variety of topics. We have done apologetics. We went through Brad Ellis's great book, Life's Big Questions, God's Big Answers. We have done world religions. We have done denominational comparison. We did a study on Ephesians. We've done a bunch of different stuff. Um, I always do media, even if it's just a couple of pictures that kind of sit up there on the screen. I want them to see that media. Uh, we do handouts. Uh, so if somebody shows up and they don't have the book or they're totally lost, they have an opportunity to find their way. Um, we do mostly lecture with a lot of questions being asked, and so there's a lot of back and forth. But we do some small group stuff. We do some role-playing stuff occasionally. Not often. You know, you got to fill out your group. Uh, role-playing is more fun with the kiddos when you're acting like a Mormon or acting like a Jehovah's Witness, and they get to interact with you a little bit. Uh, it's great for sharpening skills, but sometimes your group has to be more receptive than, than they might be. Um, so that's our Sunday morning, and it takes a, a careful prioritization. Most churches offer a Sunday morning Bible class, but what is it going to take for it to really sing? So we want people to feel like they are being sort of you know, drifted down the river from connecting in worship to studying the Bible. We want that organic movement to take place. And for us, we have a fellowship hour. It's about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on what you go in there for. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But that was an organic way for us to get people connected to the study. Um, and so I want us to get all the way to share, but we're not quite there. We're only about halfway there. Well, a third according to the slides, but halfway there in, in spirit. So how can we remove roadblocks? If you're like me, you've heard every excuse in the book. Our kids would never behave. We have this obligation going on. We just don't have time to do that, Pastor. So consider your families. It's not just about saying, I'm teaching good stuff and you should be there. Well, no kidding. But what else can we do to help families? Can we... Make sure there's something available for the kids. We have a Sunday school available for the kiddos at the same time as our adult Bible class. So the adults have an opportunity to stay in the church 
and drink coffee and eat cake and study the Bible while their kiddos or grandkiddos are downstairs. It's a good thing. Uh, consider their physical needs. I just mentioned they're eating and drinking. We have water. We have coffee. Actually, we go a little bit all out here at Faith, and we have like whole smorgasbords and buffets. But you could just have some store-bought cookies and some coffee and some tea or some water and anything that kind of fills the tummy because we're all a little bit hungry after worship. Now, our worship gets over around 10, 10, 15. So if yours gets over at 11, 30, you might have different considerations. This is just the what works for us. Also consider parishioner motivations. I found that you miss out on your best, most hardcore people when you don't challenge them. So we need to make sure that our Bible studies are challenging. We also need to keep in mind people's comfort. I've had many people tell me, I just feel like I'm going to be behind when I show up. And I think encouraging them to realize that we are all in a process of growth and none of us are fully formed, including the teacher, right? Including the teacher who's like half a step ahead of the class if he's lucky. Uh, I think it gives them more comfort to come in and join us and be part of our dynamic. Now, I want to take a minute. I want to put a pin in kind of the congregation as a whole. And I want us to focus for a moment on new members. This is not a brag, but I think it helps you understand why this is such a big thing for me. We have brought in uh, over 100 new members in the last three and a half years. Now, I'm going to talk at the end about why that's kind of remarkable. I don't think we're in a, a particularly special or fertile place for that to happen. But I do think the things I'm sharing with you will help that happen in your congregation as well. So the way we treat new members is key because out of that hundred, and, and yeah, it includes baptisms. Um, out of that hundred, we've only gotten two adults who were completely unchurched. Everyone else was coming from some sort of church background. They had a basic concept of who Jesus is, what baptism is, what the Lord's Supper is, why church is important. And, and of course, we want to share more with them about those things. But I always think we need to have a little bit of a, of a process with these newer members or prospective new members. They may not join. Maybe they just want to join and it never happens. So how can we help them get from the front door to the heart of our congregation? We call our process Faith 101, Faith 101.5, or I do anyway. I'm not sure I could get everyone else to say that. But they do a pretty faithful job of carrying it out. And then we have our adult information class or gatherings in between. And I'll talk about mixing didasco. With oikotome, if you don't know Greek, don't worry. I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. But there's many different ways that we learn. And I think we can take a page from youth catechesis, youth confirmation with our adults. So let's go ahead and just take a quick peek at Faith 101. And it's called Faith 101 because we're faith. If you're St. Peter's, it would be St. Peter's 101. If you're Emmanuel, it would be Emmanuel 101. Get it? Before adult catechesis, we should articulate the life and the DNA of our congregation. What is Faith Lutheran Church all about? What are we about that other churches in the area may not be about? I think it's important for us to know that and to be able to share that, especially if we are pastors or other leaders who may be paid staff or are just key volunteers. It's important for us to know what makes our congregation tick. We also want to explain church materials. There is nothing more frustrating to a new person who doesn't really know the lay of the land then going, ooh, I would like to be part of that group. And in the materials, it says, call Mike. Who's Mike? Oh, everybody knows Mike. Not this person. Give a phone number. Give a last name. Give an email. Give whatever Michael lets you give so they can make that connection. Make sure they know they can talk to pastor and he can get them connected or an elder or a greeter, whoever. Um, have a purposeful discussion. I think it's important for us to tell them what we expect to articulate what we are. It's also very important for us to listen to what they have to say. Their opinions are valid. And at the end of the day, we may disagree with some of the things that they think, but it could help us grow. It's really good to get outsiders' perspectives. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the instruction that takes place. So all of this has been taking place with people who are interested in the congregation. At Faith, if you are a member of another LCMS congregation, we get a lot of people who move into York because it's a nice little community. Um, and so they'll join us from another LCMS church in another community. Well, we transfer them in, and they don't go through this new member class of catechesis. But for those who come in from other church bodies or those who come in completely unchurched, we do teach. We want them to know what it is we believe. There's a couple different ways that we do this. There's didasco, 
which is the kind of instruction that we're used to giving. I'm teaching you about this right now. And uh, we see that several times in the Bible. These are not the only three places, but you know, Paul says in Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. We are great at that in the LCMS. Fantastic. I think our teaching is really second to none. I'm biased, but I really do believe that. But an, an area that maybe we neglect, I hope not. I hope it just happens organically, but I'm not sure we're systematic in using it. It's not Didasco teaching, which is more like classroom instructional, but oikotome, which is building one another up, learning by experiencing, learning through fellowship and activity and serving. So a great one is uh, 1 Thessalonians, where Paul again says, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. You know, this happens organically most of the time. But I think it's important, especially with prospective and newer members and members that may have gotten a little forgotten along the way, that we are deliberate about building them up. So all of this is available in the PowerPoint. I'm going to keep moving. How can these work together? I'm going to throw a little shout out uh, to my brother here in Nebraska, Kenton Bertel. Kenton did a really phenomenal webinar about confirmation. Kenton's program is, well, let's just face it, it's way cooler than mine. Um, and it is very clear that he spends a lot of personal time thinking about the kids that he's serving. They do a lot of neat activities. They do experiential learning. Do we ever think to do that with our adults? I'm guessing that right now you are in the midst of confirmation. We started a couple weeks ago, and I'm enjoying myself, and we're doing some fun and goofy stuff in addition to our learning. But what do we do with our adults? A lot of the time we let them, you know, break the ice. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? And then we just get right into teaching them. Here's what baptism is. Here's what the Lord's Supper is. Well, that's great, but can we give them an opportunity to learn by doing, by experiencing? Uh, one of the pictures there is a classroom, obviously, but the other one is one of our kiddos on a mission trip. And she is learning how to do something practical and important by doing it. So I just think there's a couple of different ways. And be prepared to adjust your teaching methodology. Faith has responded very well to lecture. But I know there were classes that I had at St. Peter's where lecture wasn't the best way. It was more like a small group discussion. I think we need to be ready to adjust as needed. So after our catechesis, and yes, I did blow right through that because I think most of us know how we want to do that. This really isn't about that. Um, I want us to talk about My Church 101.5. Now, awkward title, right? But this is the step between teaching and bringing in as a full member of the congregation, ready to rock and roll, ready to take on whatever comes their way. And we are careful not to bring them into heavy volunteering responsibilities unless they've indicated they can handle that. If they were an elder at their last church and they're not totally burnt out, we might get them involved pretty quickly. But if they're not, we try to give them six months, a year to just sort of get used to the church and maybe do some short term stuff before we get them you know, on a committee. And I believe in committees. I think committees are great, but it's not for everyone at every stage in their development. So I, I encourage you to add this after this. So uh, your transfers weren't in the class unless your church does things differently. That's fine. But you have these people who maybe were Methodist or Baptist or Roman Catholic or nothing and you took them through this class, and you want to bring them back together with everyone else. And I would encourage you to bring in members of your congregation who are just like the best foot forward of your congregation. These are salt of the earth, wonderful members that can mix it up and interact with them. We have a thing called Connect, Grow, Share Meetings, uh, where we have some amazing people from the church. We have some elders. We have some other leaders who come together. And uh, we have a very deliberate evening of eating good food. You know, nothing, nothing junky, good, good food. You want to feed them well. Um, showing them some things about our church, doing some activities together, breaking the ice and helping them understand what they might be able to get into in our church uh, down the road. And so we listen to what they have to say. Who are you? What have you been about before? And how do you want to get involved here? I'll give you an example in just a little bit. I'm not quite ready for that yet. One thing we do is we give them a catalog. Now, you're going to see in this catalog, it says 2017. We've actually changed the way we do our catalog here. We, we completely renovated the way we do our directory. And so now we attach our catalog to our directory, and we've made it very easy to swap out pages and stuff. But the basic catalog is still available. 
And if you are interested in having a catalog at your congregation, I'd be happy to share this with you. I know of churches in Ohio that have used it and have really enjoyed it. So, And you can make it better than we have. This is just a template. So as you look in the catalog, I'll just go through this kind of quickly here. You have a welcome, a table of contents, which is always nice at the beginning of any document. You have the staff information, our emails, our phone numbers, ways that you can get in touch with us. Uh, the next page, you have our various chairs of the congregation and ways to get in touch with them. You have a statement of faith that explains who we are. I'd be happy to give this catalog to anybody that walked in off the street and said, who are you guys and what are you doing around here? It's a nice thing to be able to present to somebody. Uh, we have a connect section that talks about our worship. Again, we are a relatively small congregation, so we don't have pages and pages of information here. We have Grow, which explains what studies are available and how people might be able to get invested in them. Normally, we would have uh, first and last names and full telephone numbers, again, for the sake of anonymity. We haven't included all of that. Then we have a share section. How can you get involved? You can be in the LWML. You can be in the LLL. You can be part of short-term projects that we're doing, you know, rake and run, snow removal, all of that good stuff, putting rock around the church, which we need to do pretty soon. And more hands make lighter work. You know how that goes. All right, so wrapping up this Faith 101.5 or My Church 101.5, I say consider interviewing each member family. You don't have to get mom and dad separated in rooms and, you know, make them collaborate on their stories. But before you release them into the wild of the church and all of a sudden they need to fend for themselves and they'll figure out if they want to do something, maybe interview them. We have a spark inventory, which is just like a big list of things that people might be interested in and a whole other list of things that people consider their passions. So you might find prison ministry on the passion page. Well, we don't have that ministry at Faith, but I would encourage them to promote it. And maybe it's something we could have down the road. And the example I like to give is the IT specialist example. Let's say you get an IT specialist who joins your congregation, and this guy or gal makes big bucks doing this uh, in, their, in their job. Some IT specialists might want to do IT for the church down the road sometime because they love doing it, and they're good at it, and they can't stand how junky the church's website is, and they want to help. Some IT specialists might be so burnt out by their job, they want to mow the lawn or paint walls or cook. You just don't know, but by asking people and by giving them a chance to voice their passions, you can find out. And I found that a lot of IT people are happy to use their gifts, but we don't want to assume and we don't want to wring their talents out of them. We want them to present them willingly. It's all about expectations. What do they expect of us? And we need to be ready to be realistic about what we might not be doing well. And what do we expect of them? I think it's important for them to know that. They don't have to do it necessarily but they need to know what it is. All right, so we want to help all of our members grow. And if you're like me, when you're listening to somebody else speak, you get a little skeptical and you get a little frustrated and you go, yeah, well, that's great at faith, but my congregation is different than that. We don't have any interest in Bible study at our church. Uh, we have a lot of activities that distract us in our community. I don't know about you. Well, I just, I wrote this down. Last year, York were state champions in football basketball, golf, speech, and several other things. We are an athletic town, and we are crazy about our sports, but we're also good at band. We're good at speech. We're good at a lot of things. And so, yeah, people are super busy in York, and it's hard to compete for their time. It really is. So trust me, you're not different than us in that regard. And maybe you say, you know, we just have a history of low Bible study attendance. I get it. There was less than 10 people in Bible study when I arrived here at Faith, and I'll get into that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm going to encourage you to open your minds and think about turning weaknesses into strengths. When I was at St. Peter's, the ministry prior to this, you had to go through, we did a $6 million building project. Can you wrap your brains around that? I, I almost can't, and I was in it. Um, and you had to go through metal doors, and then you had to go up the stairs to a secretary's office, and then she had to let you through another locked door, and then you got into the hallway with all of the offices, and then you had to go through another locked door to get to me. So you weren't getting to me unless you had an appointment. <laughs> uh, maybe if you dropped in and I knew you really well, you could get in. But faith is not like that at all. You walk in the front doors of the church, and to your right, you have the secretary's office. To your left, you have pastor's office. And look at this amazing picture window that they put in. 
Now I'm showing you this perspective because as you come out of the bathrooms, I'm the first thing you see back there. And I'm like a zoo animal. I say that in all love. I'm like a zoo animal. You can go and you can observe me and you can make eye contact with me and you can go, hey, pastor, hey, I see you're looking at me. I'm going to come in and chat with you, which is exactly what the first couple of years here at Faith were like. And I loved talking to people. But you know, sometimes I was doing a Bible study. Sometimes I was writing a sermon. Sometimes I was caring for somebody who was in pain. And so this was not my ideal situation for an office. Plus, you had to walk past my office to go anywhere in the church. So it wasn't like you could even avoid me if you wanted to. So what did I do? I embraced it. I embraced it. I put toys on my window. I've got Star Wars toys in this picture, but sometimes it's uh, superheroes. Sometimes it's pop figures, pop vinyls. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. And if you look carefully at that picture, you can see lots of toys in my office. I have little boys, so I can kind of use that as an excuse. But... I have those there so that people will pay attention and come over and say hi. We have a big preschool that, that is in our church. It gets about 50 to 60 students a year, just preschool. And those kiddos walk past my window and they see the toys and they nose up to the window like they're looking in a toy store and they go, hi, pastor. And I can come out and I can talk to the parents and it's awesome. What do I do if I'm doing a Bible study or a sermon? I just have a second office. I'm sitting in it right now. And I've learned to embrace that. And I kind of get the best of both worlds. If I want to be down the hall, I can be. If I want to be in my office, I'm available. I can have my door shut, and the regulars know not to come in if the door is shut. But for the most part, I'm available, and I'm saying howdy, and I'm putting a friendly face on the congregation, and that's just the way it's going to be here at Faith. All right. <clears throat> when I came to Faith, I told you there was less than 10 people in Bible study, and that is true. And those 10 people were at odds with 50 people, that were going to the coffee hour. Maybe it was 35, 40 people, but it was a pretty good sized group. And what had been set up is there was a fellowship hour. Like I said, it was about 15 minutes um, where people could come in and they could have coffee cake or they could have salami and cheese. I mean, whatever, coffee and sit. And they had round tables and it was just a good family atmosphere. And if the kiddos were downstairs, for Sunday school, they could sit there and eat and gab, and when the kiddos were done, they'd all go. Bible study was off in a conference room, and so you could only fit 20, 30 people in there on a good day, and there was less than 10, and they said, Pastor, you got to do something about this. And so I went to fellowship and not to Bible study <laughs> um, for at least a couple of months, and then I started to get the lay of the land, and we did start our Bible study in the conference room. And it took us years to get out of the conference room. But eventually we did. Eventually, through very careful and slow and deliberate conversations with key people in the congregation, uh, we discovered that if we just gave fellowship a little bit of time, then we could come in and do Bible study afterwards in the same room. It's the best Bible study room we have in the whole church. And the Bible study grew rapidly. We were getting upwards of 60 people when I was doing world religions in there. Now we're doing a denominational comparison. It's more like 40, 45 people. But it's a good-sized group. And when you count there's another 30, 35 kids downstairs, we're getting 70, 80 people after church to study the Bible together. We have a really good time. Uh, so that has worked for us, but that was a slow and deliberate process. We actually did uh, our Bible study in the sanctuary for a while. We did it in the conference room for a while. And we tried to make both work, and it just wasn't working for us. So give it time, be open-minded, be flexible, and you never know what's going to happen. Now, there's more than one model. And I want to share a model with you because I guess my question for you is, is it Sunday morning or bust? If you're really struggling to get people to study the Bible on Sunday morning, might you consider having Bible study on another evening? Uh, or another day. I, I say evening because evening is generally when people who work uh, can come together. I'm going to tell you about something that we did at St. Peter's. At St. Peter's, we had what we called St. Peter's training, equipping, preparing, and sending. We called it steps, which I know is, is too cute for words, and, and we enjoyed it. I thought it was really cool. We found that with uh, three worship services, and then we would add a fourth one on Monday night during the summer, our congregation was very split. The Saturday people weren't interacting with the Sunday people who may not have been interacting with the Monday people. And the Sunday morning Bible class, which was not pastor taught, 
was getting about 30 to 40 people a week, which sounds great, but not in a congregation of 2,000. Um, the pastors were off teaching adult confirmation, which was usually me, and junior confirmation, which was usually the senior pastor. And it worked out fine, but we wanted to engage more people in God's word. And we had some small groups getting together, but there was a big segment of the congregation that was not studying the Bible. And we just didn't see how Sunday morning was going to get that accomplished. So we started a Wednesday evening program. It started with four sessions a year. We broke for Advent, we broke for Lent, we broke for summer. But then in each session, we'd offer a variety of classes. We'd serve a meal at six, and then the classes would start at seven sharp, and they'd be done at eight on the dot. We wanted people to be able to count on leaving by 8.05, being home by 8.15, and getting those kiddos to bed, because it was Wednesday night, and most of them had school the next morning. We actually got practices and games to wrap around steps. Uh, that was possible in Fort Wayne. It may not be possible in your community, but that was the, our situation. One class was taught by an outside expert, and since uh, Concordia Theological Seminary was 20 minutes down the road, we got uh, Dr. Chuck Geeshan to come in and teach. We got Dr. Cameron McKenzie to come in and teach. Um, it was awesome. I mean, they would come in, and we would give them the option. They could teach on something they're passionate about uh, that they don't get to teach at the seminary or don't have opportunity, or they could teach on the thing they teach at the seminary. And so we had some guys coming in and doing really fun stuff with our people, uh, guys and women. We had women experts that would come in and talk about various things. We had a lady come in and teach about Islam, and it was absolutely fascinating. Now, we had eight pastors in that congregation. Uh, two called, and the rest were uh, just to, there to help us, mostly retired or working for the seminary or what have you. But we would have pastor-led classes and we would have lay-led classes. Uh, you may not need a pastor to have a class on marriage or parenting. Um, and so we, we utilized our intelligent and wonderful laity for that. We'd also offer stuff for youth. There was a nursery. Because what do you do with a two-year-old? Well, you put them in the nursery and, and they would have a good time there. We had a preschool offering, K through 5, 6 through 8, 9 through 12. Everybody had something that they could connect with at STEPS. Now, it had to be adjusted. It was a smashing success. Overnight, we had 400 people coming together each week, and that was in addition to Sunday morning. That was in addition to the small groups. And so it was like, we figured it out. But it needed to be adjusted, even then. Um, it started to shrink a little bit. I think by the time I left St. Peter's, we were getting about 250 to 300 people a week. And so you know, the initial excitement and buzz did die down a little bit. And we, suit, we, we, uh, we altered the model to suit our needs a bit. So in 2013, we, we replaced four sessions with three. That gave the teachers more time to cover their topic, and we needed less outside experts because it wasn't always easy to get a SEM professor or another PhD from the community to come in. Uh, they were busy people, and so we wanted to be sensitive to that as well. All right, here's where I think it makes a little more practical sense. Could you do this in a rural and small town congregation? We have certainly talked about doing it at faith. We haven't yet, and I'll explain why in a moment. But how can we do this if we don't have eight pastors and hundreds, if not thousands, of people who could potentially come to these things? Most of us are sole pastors. I have a part-time pastor of visitation that serves alongside me. I have a full-time secretary in the office, so I'm very blessed compared to a lot of pastors in the rural and small town setting. Uh, but I'm the only teaching pastor here in the congregation, and so... Who, who, who am I going to get to help me with this if I do this, right? I think that we should at least be willing to consider scaling this. So here's the core of steps. There's food. It may not be a meal. Maybe it's donuts. Maybe it's coffee cake. But there's food involved. We actually started, um, well, I'll get to that on the next slide. Classes are offered for every age group. Here's the thing. Maybe the kids aren't taught. Maybe they're just entertained. Maybe the kids are playing games. Uh, maybe they're not in an actual class, but they're, they're engaged while the parents are learning. Um, pick a time slot that works. We did ours on Wednesday evenings, but maybe Tuesday evening is better for you. Thursday evening, Saturday morning. I don't know. You know. I don't. Um, I think having some variety for adults is helpful, although not necessary. Maybe you as the pastor, if, if you know, I know not all of you listening are pastors, but maybe your pastor teaches a class on biblical doctrinal stuff. And maybe somebody else in the congregation teaches a class on Christian living. Or if your pastor is like me, he might enjoy teaching on Christian living. And uh, somebody from the congregation could teach on biblical doctrinal stuff. It's up to you guys. 
Now, here's some things to consider. Meals do require volunteers. If you have Lenten meals, which a lot of churches in this area do, it takes a little bit of an army to make these things go. Um, do you charge for the meal? We got to the point where we were charging 3 to $4 a meal, and the meal changed. There were tacos, there was spaghetti, there was hamburgers and hot dogs. We always figured it was a little healthier than McDonald's and a little cheaper than McDonald's, and it gave people an opportunity to show up at the church and not be stressed out. So we didn't think it was a bad thing to charge three to four bucks a person for their meal. Um, also, keep in mind that Wednesday might not work. People are very, very busy, and Wednesday night might be something else. And you might have midweek confirmation on Wednesday like we do at Faith. So if we did this on a Wednesday, I'd probably be teaching midweek, and somebody else would have to teach the other stuff. And your Sunday school will be affected. Um, at St. Peter's, we had uh, a very stripped down Sunday program uh, after church because people were coming together on Wednesday for the heavy duty stuff. And so if you have a good Sunday morning presence like we do at Faith, it may not be worth it. And, and so that's something like we keep talking about it. We might do it, but we just haven't made that plunge yet. All right, sharing. I'm going to wrap up with sharing and uh, I'll try to do this in the next 10 minutes or so. So we have time for questions and answers. We all know that you learn more by doing. At least uh, that's been my experience. It's kind of like my high school Spanish. If you don't lose it or if you don't use it, you lose it. I haven't used my high school Spanish, and so I'm not fluent in Spanish, unfortunately. I wish I was. So uh, research has shown that 5% of people remember what they hear in a lecture. Isn't that depressing? 5%. 50% of what they discuss in a group, that's better. 90% of what they teach or use immediately. So what does this tell us? It tells us that after we teach them, after we have these discussions in worship and Bible study, we need to put it into action. It's going to make a big difference if we do. People will retain these things. So sharing through vocation. Everyone has a vocation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.20 that we need to remain in the station in which we were called. We have a number of different stations. So I'll give myself as an example. I am a parish pastor. I'm also a Christian. I'm a husband. I'm a dad. I'm a son. I'm a brother. Occasionally I run. Occasionally I write. I have hobbies that I'm interested in. And so my vocation as father sometimes requires different things than my vocation as husband which sometimes requires different things from my vocation as pastor. And so in all of these things, I have an opportunity to serve my neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? As a dad, I consider my neighbor to be my two boys. Obviously, I am a father figure to my confirmands and, and probably many people in my congregation, but primarily I'm daddy to two little boys, Jonathan and Andrew. As a husband, I have a responsibility to be a strong head of household in my household and help my wife with all those wonderful things that she accomplishes each and every day. And so this helps us to understand our need to share at home with our families, in our workplaces. For a pastor, it's kind of easy. Uh, but maybe you're a banker. Maybe you're a farmer. You know, who knows what you do? You work in an office building. This is still an uh, important opportunity for you, really, anywhere we find ourselves. And you see that little picture there as the head of the family should teach it in a simple way to his household. So we have vocation guiding us. Um, this is a neat little uh, pictograph, infogram. I don't know what you call these things, but they're cool. This one is from Concordia Publishing House, and it's promoting the family altar, which is a really kind of formal way of saying you should have a, a, a deliberate Bible presence in your home. Uh, it starts at home. So I'll give you an example of what we do in the Trampy household. Uh, if you want that, that's in the PowerPoint, of course. It can be as simple as having a couple of kids' hymnals available, a couple of children's Bibles available, or, you know, who cares if you have a children's Bible? Just go ahead and use uh, an adult Bible and bring it down to your kids' level. If your kids are teenagers, they can probably handle it at the adult, you know, full blast. Our kids are little, so no. But we sing a hymn together. We do a little devotion together. Mom and Dad explain what that means and what it looks like in our lives, and all of us are edified through that. We pray before we eat. We talk about the Bible. And both boys go to a parochial school, so they always have little questions and you know things that they bring home that we can talk about. But even if they go to a public school, like I did my entire life, there's plenty of things that we can be talking about at home, equipping them to go into the world with the Word of God. It doesn't have to be complicated at all. We also share through mission work. So when I got to faith, 
Faith had never been on a youth mission trip. And I think we're in our 55th year as a congregation, maybe 56th year as a congregation. And so uh, we actually did what we needed to do. I ran a 50 mile race. That's a story for another day. We ended up going to Oklahoma City and, and engaging in mission work. But we also do a lot of local mission work. So it doesn't mean going to another locale. It can just mean getting engaged in your community. Um, we give to Mission Central. I'm guessing some of you listening to this are aware of Mission Central. Mission Central is an awesome opportunity to serve worldwide right from where you're at. Maybe it's the cornfields of Nebraska like me. Maybe it's the cornfields of Iowa. Who knows where you're at? But each of us has an opportunity to give to that mission effort being made throughout the world. I was joking with Todd before I started. Some of these slides look a little bit like they did at my presentation at the RSDM conference. So you can go ahead and ignore that more will be said. I'm saying it all right now. Let's wrap this up. Let's recap just a little bit and then let's open it up for questions. I believe that teaching the faith to adults involves more than adult Bible study. It's important. I, I would never dismiss it. And for us, that's the largest gathering of learning that takes place outside of our worship is our Sunday morning Bible class. Um, but I also think it's important to create intentional movement. I may be just at the brink of annoying when I am talking about Bible class in worship. I don't let it get in the way of the liturgy, but by golly, if I'm preaching and we're talking about the rise of unbelief in the world and I'm doing a Bible class on world religions, I'm going to, pardon me, I'm going to bring that into the discussion. I am going to make sure they understand that, you know, you may have some questions after this sermon. We've got a whole hour where we can sit and talk about these things at Bible study and I'll be happy to answer any question you have in Bible study within reason, you know. We also want to create intentional movement towards sharing because as we saw in that, uh, that statistical slide, people aren't going to retain a lot of this if they're not actually living it out in their lives, whether it be in their homes or in their workplaces or just in the community at large. When we bring in new adult members, I think it's important for us to be very intentional. Make sure they understand what your church is about. You want to teach them the basics of the Christian and Lutheran uh, teachings, of course, but we also want them to understand what makes the visible church, the local congregation tick. What does it mean to be a member of this visible group of people? Not just the invisible church, not just the church in general. Um, I think we should employ several different teaching styles. If you're a pastor like me, it's way easier to give a lecture than it is to have uh, role playing or case studies. Uh, sometimes it's easier than discussion because by golly, once you open up discussion, you don't know what's going to get asked. And you might have to say, I don't know. That's okay. I found that people are incredibly understanding around here when I say, you know what? I have no clue. I'll look it up. I'll figure it out. Maybe you can help me look it up and we can share notes. All of that is perfectly fine. And then uh, finally here, consider trying something new. If Sunday morning just doesn't seem like it's going to go at all, consider doing something like steps. If we did it at faith, it wouldn't be called steps. It wouldn't the acronym wouldn't make sense, um, but we are thinking about it. May never happen, but it's a good conversation. See if you can turn perceived weaknesses into strengths. I mean, we are a very sports-centric community. Um, our Bible class was very small when I arrived. My office wasn't where I would have maybe wanted it. And yet in all of these things, we have thrived. We brought in over 100 new members. And I think a lot of that is just caring for people and making sure they understand what the church is about and caring for their needs not only on their way in, but also two years in, three years in, making sure that they are cared for and heard and respected. Pray and utilize your congregation's leadership. If you're not a pastor listening to this, you know, talk to your pastor. If you are a pastor, talk to your lay leaders. They can be such a benefit and a resource. You'll get so much more done with them than you will on your own. We are not islands. And in case you're wondering, you know, what is in the water in York? And I'm still trying to figure out that myself. York is a great community. We have another LCMS church in York. And it's much bigger than us. We share a school with that church. 1,600 members. They offer a lot more offerings than we do because they're much bigger than us. And yet we've grown. And we're one of dozens of churches. Well, maybe a dozen. And we're like the sixth or seventh biggest church in York. So there's lots of competition here in town. But God continues to provide for us. And while we're not focused on numerical growth, we are focused on the ones that come to us. We try to make sure they're cared for 
and blessed and that they're in God's word. All right. I've got another slide, but it's basically just references. I did the self-serving thing of including my dissertation. If you're really geeking out on this stuff and you want to go like full geek, I would be happy to send you my dissertation. Just send me an email and I'll shoot it off to you. The end. The end. Oh, fantastic stuff. Uh, great stuff, Heath. Thank you so much. And as he mentioned, if you want any more information or if you have questions that you don't want to ask here or you want the ministry catalog or any of those things, please shoot Pastor Trampy an email. Just pastortrampy at gmail.com. We put it up on the uh, features here. That should come out or you'll find it uh, if you get the copy of the, uh, of the PowerPoint. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. And folks, if you have questions, please get them in. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we had a question early on, and and uh, it was, do you use the same program or instruction for everyone, no matter their age? And I think you answered that pretty well throughout your um, throughout your uh, presentation today. But just maybe uh, a word on how do you work through the process to determine uh, what's going to work best for the different age groups in your congregation, and how did you come to determine what you would do for the adults? That's a very good point. I, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I, you know, like, do we teach the same thing in Sunday school that we teach to the adults on Sunday morning? Like, is the whole day about Ephesians 5? Um, that would be a no. And, and I'll get into other things as well. But first, uh, like our Sunday school is going through various Bible stories, like probably many Sunday schools are. And we in our adult class are going through denominational comparisons. Um, I gave them the opportunity of doing a Bible book or doing another study, or doing denominational comparison, we're using the CPH study, and I add a lot to it, like I want it to be a multi-week discussion, but that would be something different. Now, if you're talking about like catechesis, I am doing CPH's brand new 60 lesson study with my kiddos, we're using the 2017 catechism, but when I'm studying with my adults, I like to use A.L. Berry's What About series, I make sure each person gets a whole copy of that, and then I use God Connects, from Lutheran Hour Ministries, and I also use a book called Powerful Love that has worked really well for me. It's in the, the little work cited there, and I use the catechism. And so I've found something that works for me. I'd love it if everything was in one volume. I wish it were. But no, I, I definitely teach the group differently based on who I'm getting. And I've learned some hard lessons here. My new member classes at St. Peter's were like 20, 30 people. So it was like teaching a adult class, you know, like at a college or something. Now that I'm here, I might get a new member class of two people. And so it's a lot more discussion and it's a lot more laid back. And I've had to adjust on the fly. But that would be maybe my short answer to that. Excellent. I think perhaps uh, one takeaway uh, simply, you know, you, you give us some great tools. Uh, but what's really important is that you consider getting to know your congregation and what makes them tick and then using these tools to address that accordingly. Right. I, I'll just admit right now, I was still pretty young when I got to faith. I was 32. I'd only been a pastor for four years. I thought I was just going to bring all my tricks from St. Peter's, you know, big church, really killing it and into this church and everybody was just going to love it. Yes and no. Some things worked great. Some things didn't. And you just have to kind of try it. And you have to be very patient. Yeah. Patience. And uh, Angie and I, my wife is the director of uh, of youth here at our church in, in Concordia. And she has for years now been a youth leader and she likes to use the F word a lot. And that F word is flexibility. Oh yeah, big time, big time. Big time. Yeah, I'm with that. Uh, we have another question here. How many weeks do you teach adult catechesis? That's a great question. Um, so not counting the before and end matter, that Faith 101, Faith 101.5, which is, it's actually outside of the adult catechesis, because I wouldn't take an LCMS transfer through adult catechesis. It's about 12 weeks. It's, I, I don't know if that's standard. I know some churches do more, some churches do less, but I found that 12 weeks gives us an opportunity to get through most topics I'm interested in teaching them, and it gives us a chance to have like a week or two where we kind of spill over. So maybe we take two weeks on baptism, maybe we take two weeks on the Lord's Supper, um, and we meet as long as we need to meet. So it wouldn't be like a solid hour. It'd be more like an hour and a half, um, maybe even two hours if we're really in the discussion. People have to be flexible, and I have to be flexible. Yeah, there you go. Here it is again, flexibility. 
Uh, Pastor Fields uh, gave us a, a little resource here. He says, I like using the VARK, V-A-R-K assessment to see what kind of learners I have in my classes, visual learners, auditory, readers, or kinetic. And that goes to trying to reach the people where they're at. That's great. I didn't even know uh, that that was a thing, but I'm going to look it up. Thank exactly. you for teaching me. Exactly. Yeah. We, we always need to learn, don't we? We sure do. Never stop growing. That's right. Uh, folks, I don't see any other questions here, and we are right at our cutoff time. So if you have one, get it in very quickly. Uh, but again, thank you, Pastor Trampy, for your uh, information today and the great tools. And please, folks, take advantage of these and, and take advantage of the resource that, that he is himself and get a hold of him. He's got a lot of great, great information. And, and he's just a, a really super nice guy to know. I, 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 I love that I've had the oh, opportunity to, to get to know Pastor Trampy. A uh, couple things that are coming well, up on our schedule. You, oh, <laughs> you're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 webinars coming up. We have um, uh, Ministry to Inactives. I'm doing that one on October 18th. We have Introducing New Hymns in the Small Congregation. Reverend Will Whedon, who is the Director of LCMS Worship, will be doing that one on November 5th. And Summer Outreach Strategies. We're doing that in December, on December 6th, so you have time to get them ready come summer. Uh, Reverend Jacob Mueller from right down the road from here in Concordia, he's the pastor at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Emma, Missouri. He'll be taking care of that one. Uh, Amy put up a reminder, but I would remind you also, our big national mission conference is coming up November 8th through the 10th in Kansas City. Uh, the uh, uh, heading Have No Fear. Please uh, get your registrations in for that. And a couple of Engaging Your Community events, one at Heavenly Host Lutheran Church in Cookville, Tennessee. That's on September 29th. And then I'll be over in Hastings, Nebraska, a little closer to your neck of the woods, Heath, on 10-6. Yeah. And so if you have an opportunity to go to those, please take advantage. Other than that, again, God's blessings to all of you who have attended today and to you, uh, Heath, for your ministry in York. And, uh, and may the God bless you in all that you do. God bless you.